So uh, there's a limited amount of time. What I want to do is uh, stress the first two papers. And uh, uh, they're all uh, very interesting papers. Uh, they were well explained. Uh, this is a subject I've thought about myself. Uh, I have a couple of co-authors in a project, uh, uh, Dmitry Stoyarov and Dan Silverman. And we've thought a lot about the, the model that uh, Kaplan and Denardi were both using. I think it's a common model. They're both using the same type of model. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about that and try to give you some uh, sort of qualitative insights uh, about uh, what I think they're doing and why I think it's interesting and uh, uh, say specific remarks about their individual papers. So uh, the framework of analysis that both are using is really the life cycle model, sort of the work horse uh, model for economists with, for this type of project. Uh, there, of course, are other possibilities. We could have a more elaborate model uh, where uh, people uh, were worried about their dynasty's well-being. Uh, those are interesting models. We uh, usually think of those as applying to wealthier people, maybe the life cycle model for middle class people. Uh, Another possibility is we could think of some kind of an informal care model, and I don't have a specific model in mind, but I'm thinking of a model where I raise my children and then uh, in their gratitude, uh, as, uh, as I get older, they take care of me in, uh, as a sort of a repayment. Uh, I think that might have been the model 100 years ago. Uh, uh, that was uh, the most prevalent. I think it's prevalent in other countries. Uh, we're talking about an era where uh, demography is changing and uh, the, uh, the number of older people is changing and we have to worry about uh, pressures and so on. But I think it might be also what might be going on is that older model is, is passing away and uh, we're switching to more of a, a self-providing model like the life cycle model. And then we could have government support models. Uh, government support often uh, uh, plays a role in these other models. So the life cycle model, a simple life cycle model from Modigliani is uh, think of a one-person household. The analysis here was for that uh, type of household. It's easier to do. Uh, so the, the, uh, if the person is going to be self-contained, he's going to have earnings until he retires. And if he wants his consumption to go on, he should consume less than his earnings. In the bottom uh, diagram, his wealth builds up. And then uh, when, he's, uh, when his earnings stops, uh, he can uh, finance his consumption and retirement. And that, that model has been enormously successful as a kind of an organizing principle for thinking about these uh, family problems. I would say it's been especially successful in thinking about the uh, early in life decisions up to our uh, so you can add uh, children coming and going from the household. You can add uncertain lifespan. You can add a choice of when to retire and so on. And the model's been very successful at dealing with these things. Now, after retirement, I think it's uh, been on the whole maybe a little more, a little less successful. It should be very simple at that point. You should just be running down your uh, assets that you had. When you look at the actual data, it's not clear that assets run down. Uh, like that, uh, for a cohort, uh, on average, uh, they often seem to stay relatively level for a long time. Uh, the, uh, you could add stochastic time of death, and this was the famous uh, Yari paper, and then uh, uh, he showed uh, convincingly that people should annuitize, but in reality, uh, they don't seem to go for annuities uh, for anywhere near 100% of their wealth, so you have this uh, post-retirement saving puzzle where they seem to hang on to their wealth and you have the annuity puzzle where they don't seem to want as many annuities as they should. All right, so what do I think uh, uh, these papers are doing or how could we think about this? I think of them as uh, modifying that end-of-life model. So we're going to do the life cycle model only starting at retirement uh, where people have already decided to retire and their income is, or their earnings are gone. And the modification that I think is crucial here in abstract terms is that we take that, that last period of life, we've got a single person household, and we break it into two parts 
think of it in the first part, the household is healthy. In the second part, their health deteriorates and they're in a low health status. And then afterwards, they'll, uh, they, they die. Uh, I want to think of the, uh, the poor health status is not exactly being poor medical status. So why is this distinction important? If, you're, if, you're, uh, if you have a medical condition, uh, we can contract on that pretty easily in most cases. So you can uh, say unambiguously what the diagnosis is and uh, probably lay out a treatment for it. And uh, for older Americans, uh, Medicare takes, takes care of that. You could argue about the deductibles and so on, but um, I'm more interested in chronic conditions, which are vaguer. Now, we talked about ADLs, activities of daily living. So on a survey, uh, they might ask you, do you have trouble with uh, bathing, eating, dressing, walking across the room, getting out of bed? Those are five standard activities of daily living. And I'm going to think of poor health status as being when you begin to have trouble, say, with three of these, three out of five at least. And, uh, and that's what I'm going to mean by poor health status. I'm going to think of people start out in good health, and then they go down to poor health status, and then they, they die, and all these things happen at random times. Uh, so it's more elaborate than the RE model. There's sort of uh, two stages at the end of life. Uh, finally, I want to think of, uh, uh, well, one more thing. When we're doing this, uh, the reason I'm making such a big deal about the difference between a medical condition and uh, health status is health status is it's not only a chronic condition, but it's vaguer. And if, it's hard to make a contract on that. So I'm going to think of it as being uh, uh, what I'll call an asymmetric uh, information uh, problem, where uh, I know or you know what your health status is, but it's, uh, it's hard for an insurer to know about that. And that, that's going to make uh, the provision of market insurance hard. So then lastly, I want to think of state-dependent utility. I'm, I'm, again, I'm trying to describe what these two papers are doing in abstract terms. So the utility function changes when you go into poor health. And in fact, your overall utility flow is lower, but the marginal utility gets higher is the way I want to think about it. And so when you go into low health status, to maintain any sort of standard of living, you have to start hiring assistance, and that's expensive. And that's what I want to think of as why your marginal utility gets higher. And there, there can be a Medicaid uh, nursing home option in the background. So Medicaid could pay your bills on a mean-tested basis if you're really poor, but also if you're older and you're in low health status and you have no wealth, it, it would pay for a nursing home. And that's the part of Medicaid I want to think about, the nursing home. So here we go. This, this kind of a setup really changes the model uh, at the end of life. So you thought you were going to retire and you're going to have a glorious time when you don't have to worry about anything. I, I want to change that. You, you do have to worry. You, you get into retirement, you're in good health, and you have to worry that things are going to get worse uh, soon when your health deteriorates. And at that point, you're going to want resources more than you do now. And so you've got to start planning for that. And now you see I've, I've changed the model completely because when you're in that second to the last state, you might want to even continue saving or you might want to hang on to your liquid assets and so on so you can cover that, that worst state that might come later. So this is going to encompass, if I've done this right, the Kaplan model, the Denardi model, the thing I've worked on. Uh, another recent model that's sort of like this is by Richling and Smetters, and I'll talk about that if I have a minute. So let's go to the Denardi paper. So it's, it's, a, it's a great paper. It uh, sets up a model like this, solves it numerically, estimates parameters. Uh, I think of it as a model with uh, interesting data. It uses uh, the, the big panel data set collected at University of Michigan, the HRS. It uses the, the older part of that, the HRS ahead. So that's uh, panel data every two years, about 3,200 uh, households, follows them to death. Uh, and it also uses the Medicaid or Medicare current uh, beneficiary survey, which is a big repeated cross section. If you wait, you can't link these uh, the people in the two surveys. Someday we'll have the linkage to the to the uh, Medicaid uh, expenses in the HRS. But since you can, you have two weighted samples, you can uh, sort of link them probabilistically. So it's a very nice model. Uh, 
One of the problems with the original Modigliani model is it implied that people would rapidly decumulate uh, starting once they retired. They don't seem to do that in the data. I think a model like this in general can really help out because uh, the middle class people uh, looking forward to the greater expenses they might have with poor health can actually hang on to their liquid assets, which is usually what the surveys are measuring, calling wealth, and uh, they can hang on to that for some time. And if you work through all the details of the way the mortality goes and so on, you can get pretty flat uh, wealth profiles in the data. You're, I don't know if you can see them here, but that's, that's what happens. And the, the, actually, the uh, uh, Denardi model does a pretty good job of, of illustrating that. So I think it can help out in a, in a sort of a basic way. The paper itself is really about uh, Medicaid. I'm going to think of it as uh, a paper about Medicaid nursing home care. And it, it shows a sort of surprising idea that uh, just about all groups benefit from Medicaid, not just the uh, poor people it's really most designed for. So Medicaid nursing home care comes with a, a rigorous means test. If you have annuity income, you have to turn it over to the program. You really can't have any other wealth or income besides that. You have to be in poor health uh, and so on. There's a look back uh, test and everything. It's got a rigorous test. And furthermore, it's a one size fits all. It, it gives you really one level of care and it's really pretty modest. Uh, uh, it's, on the other hand, it's pretty costly. The program would spend maybe $80,000 a year for people. Well, if you think about it, if you're a low-income person, if you've been uh, going through life with pretty low uh, uh, resources, uh, 80000 bucks a year for your consumption sounds like a pretty uh, uh, magnificent amount. And for those people, if you go through the math of this type of model, uh, they should just run down their wealth after they retire, and when their health gives out, they should go on Medicaid pretty quickly and take that $80,000, such as it is. If you're a little uh, better off than that, if you're in the middle class, well, Medicaid doesn't look so great. And what the math will tell you is uh, you should husband your resources, your liquid wealth and so on, while you're in good health. And then you should try to go at it alone at a better level than Medicaid when your health gives out. But if you keep on, uh, if you live uh, year after year, it's going to give out, and then you should go on Medicaid. So one of the interesting things is it tells you to use the Medicaid in conjunction with your private assets. And when you think about uh, Denardi's results, I won't, I won't go through, try to go through them, uh, they are roughly consistent with this. Uh, the, the poor people uh, tend to go on Medicaid uh, extensively and right away early on, and the middle class, the better off people, uh, put it off for a long time. Maybe they die uh, having taken care of themselves, but if they live an exceptionally long time, they make use of it too, and in fact, it's surprisingly valuable to them. So that's, that's the way I think about this paper. It's a very nice paper. If I switch over to the Kaplan paper, the Kaplan paper is another uh, elaborately uh, data-driven uh, analysis with the same type of model solved numerically, uh, and then uh, uh, we're going to compare it and estimate it from data. He's going to look in particular at the question of uh, why people don't choose to buy uh, private uh, long-term care insurance. So it's this Vanguard data set. Uh, I had the same impression that uh, one of the other uh, speakers did, that it's, these people seem a little better off. I think they seem quite a bit better off than the HRS people on the whole. They, they, it's a, if they have, uh, as I understood it, 10000 10, to $5 million worth of these Vanguard liquid assets, if that's in their retirement account, then they maybe look more like the HRS people. But if they have fifty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000 worth of liquid assets, that's pretty exceptional relative to the Paterba table, for example. So that, I think they're a little better off. These, the, uh, the data from Vanguard is, uh, doesn't have many covariates, but they're allowed, they've been allowed to run surveys with these people. So they ran three different surveys, and they do this on the internet. Some of it just collects uh, routine sort of demographic and other uh, variables, but other, but other survey questions are these elaborate SSQ strategic survey questions where they ask very detailed uh, hypothetical uh, questions. If you were offered this and this, if you were offered a gamble like this and this, would, would you take it? Uh, what if it was this and this, would you take that? 
and they can use that to pin down risk aversion and parameters and so on. So this is very nice, and they can use the internet to make these uh, the questions uh, uh, sort of colorful and uh, 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 richly presented and so on. So what kind of results do they get? Well, this paper is very ambitious in the sense that it allows the parameters of people's preference functions to differ between people. And they're able to do this because they have a, a big sample, but also because they have these uh, SSQ questions. Uh, and they do find heterogeneity of risk aversion and so on within the, within the uh, uh, sample. Uh, this, this makes sense. Uh, there's, there's precedent for it in the literature. It, uh, it's, it's been very difficult to do because you didn't have these, this, the option of using these nice internet questions where you could word them so carefully and uh, 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 make the questions artistically presented and so on. So that's, that's a very interesting uh, type of result. I won't uh, try to make you read the table. The, uh, of course, you'd always want to know, statistically, is this significant? It's not just how big they are. But anyway, uh, and uh, Andrew talked a lot about it. Uh, the, the, I think the predisposition in the economics profession is you want to be cautious with questions like this. Uh, I want to see what people do, not what they say they would do. So there's always a, the problem, uh, does somebody just look at the hypothetical question and blow it off or do it kind of casually? But uh, Andrew uh, did a good job of explaining how they cross-check these things and so on. It's, uh, I think it's a nice piece of analysis. Now beyond that, uh, one of the substantive questions they're looking at is, uh, uh, why don't people buy long-term care? Well, when you think about the structure of the model, it's not obvious at all that long-term care is a great thing. Because for the low-income people, they're, they're gonna, uh, long-term care is going to kick in, presumably, when your health status gives out. But they've got Medicaid. And, and Medicaid nursing home care is worth 80000 bucks. If I've got annuity income of 10000 and I bought an insurance policy that paid another 10000 that's still way under what Medicaid is going to pay me. It's not clear that I want, I mean, it's, yes, it's not clear that I want the private instrument at all. It's not clear that it's close. Uh, for a richer person that was going to try to go at it alone and postpone uh, the standard of living that comes with uh, Medicaid nursing home care, it's more realistic, I think, that they would want a private uh, long-term care policy. But even for them, the way it's set up, the one of the surprising Denardi results is that they want both their private provision and they want the Medicaid as a backstop if they happen to live a long time in that state. And once you go on Medicaid, if you've got a long-term care policy paying you 10000 a year or something, Medicaid's going to take that. It's gone. So it is, it's even for them, you're only going to be able to use it, I think, for a finite amount of time. It's not obvious that they're a great deal. So. When they, uh, here's the fraction owning a long-term care policy, 20%, is that higher or lower than what I would have thought a priori? I don't know. What's another problem here? When I set this up, I was very careful to talk about uh, medical status versus uh, uh, health, health status in general. For medical status, I think we could make a precise uh, diagnosis and I think uh, that we can write a contract on that that will pay me and that if, if I'm the payer, I can be secure that you can't lie about uh, your health status because we can check it. And if you're the uh, purchaser, you can be sure that I can't weasel out of paying you. Um, but if it's health status and, it's, and there's no microscopic count of white blood cells or something that indicates when you have three or more ADL problems, uh, this is vague, and uh, now it's really hard to write the insurance contract. Um, is this unprecedented? No, it occurs all over in economics where you have hidden costs and so on. Uh, there's a literature on it. Uh, it's, uh, there's a general principle called the revelation principle, and uh, you get, uh, tells you to look for, to write elaborate contracts which uh, have what are called uh, 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 incentive compatibility constraints in it, which, which encourage truth-telling. Uh, so you can do this. They'll be expensive, and they won't be as optimal as uh, first best uh, uh, complete information contracts. Uh, these are going to be an obstacle to having people buy long-term insurance also. 
And again, the fact that there's only 20% in practice doesn't look too bad. Now, in the, this is uh, Andrew's picture. So the orange uh, rectangle is what people bought. It was 20% of the sample had it, had long-term care, uh, private long-term care insurance. The green was he then asked the ones who didn't have, I think, as I understand this, the ones who didn't ha have the private long-term care insurance, if they were offered an ideal uh, long-term care private policy, would they buy it? And another 25% went ahead and said yes. But the long-term uh, uh, care contract that he defined with the green rectangle didn't have asymmetric information. It, we cleared that out. And the fact that uh, a lot more people would buy it, uh, it doesn't surprise me. And we put that together, we put the two together, we get the gray one and it's up at 40, uh, 45%. The model says 60% or 62% should have bought it. I don't know, I, again, I need a, uh, a confidence interval to see whether that's uh, statistically significant. Maybe we should have estimated the model implying that the gray one fit the data perfectly or something like that, or then we could do a likelihood ratio test. So I'm gonna, I'm really out of time. Uh, there's another section about uh, annuities. So there, another puzzle was why doesn't the YARI result hold? Why, do, why don't people annuitize all their liquid wealth the minute they retire? Well, again, once you elaborate the model in this way, it's not obvious that they should do that. Once you have an annuity, uh, if you ever go on Medicaid, they just take it, it's gone. Uh, and furthermore, it, so it's not obvious anymore. Now there's been some literature on that and uh, it's, it's been hard to show that this kind of stuff matters, but the, the paper that I uh, mentioned briefly by Richling and Smetters has a structure like this, although it has, it has extra things. It has more annuity uh, possibilities in it. But he, he finds that people don't want to annuitize at all when they retire. And as I have worked with this with my co-authors, we don't go the full whole hog with these extra securities. We just have uh, Medicaid in this basic uh, model. But it's, it's not obvious to us either that there's, an, that there's a serious annuity puzzle. And in fact, when you look at their quote from another paper that they wrote, it isn't obvious that the middle class people uh, really feel like they're uh, grossly under annuitized. Um, so I, th I think there might be more to, s to say there. So I'm out of time. In, these are both nice papers. The third paper was nice too. I just, uh, it doesn't uh, go with these and I didn't have time. But the... I'm happy to be here. <laughs> we're happy to have you. But the, uh, um, on these two, these are both nice papers. They're, they're both making good use of data, modern use of data, collecting their own data, using multiple data sets together to get extra uh, results. Uh, I think these, this uh, uh, asymmetric information problem is an interesting one uh, that, that lurks here. Uh, uh, but as I say, I like the way they've modified the model. The sort of deep insights from the original Modigliani model are still here. But we're, we, just, we need more details, I think, to uh, make it more consistent with the data. And uh, the underlying principles are still there that people want to decumulate. It's just a little bit delayed. Thank you very much. Yes. OK. <laughs> Does anybody uh, have a question? I, I see one here. Start uh, on the um, the tontines. So it seems to me that the background there is the the cost difference is that you're having the tontine purchasers hold more of the aggregate longevity risk, at least in a large tontine pool. In a small tontine pool, there's actually issues of why now they're holding some idiosyncratic pool risk. But in a large enough pool, what you're doing is having them hold some of the aggregate longevity risk, which is priced, and so potentially is a cheaper contract. Um, for a little bit less insurance, but maybe the less insurance that everybody else is, is going to, you know, the, the rest of the world is going to hold some of that anyway, so why don't they? Um, and, and I guess, I, so I, that's a comment, you, I guess, and then for you guys, I mean, John sort of raised the point, you each have a nice proscriptive models in some sense, where you take some parts of behavior either as observed, and then you think about modifying Medicare, or you ask them hypothetical questions to get preference creditors, and then say, okay, given those, what, would you, what should you do? 
and then the other one, what should Medicare be at? But John sort of points to maybe the, the, the interlinkages between the two being very important. Now, I'm sorry, because you don't want more details in either of those difficult proscriptive problems already. But both the extent to which Medicare insures against a tail risk and therefore changes your incentives to buy long-term care insurance and the extent to which the public insurance is really interacting with the private insurance that you observe. And so the, the range of instruments which you assume would vary when people have very Medicare would be quite different. Is that a question? Or a comment? I don't know. I mean, it didn't end with one of those, uh, but it still was kind of a question. Yeah, we agree. And I think find if you look in the details of the modeling that we're kind of trying to cover that complementarity. Another question. So uh, I also enjoyed all the papers. A question from Osha. Uh, in terms of design, you've picked the time trajectory, I think, unconditional on the pool's mortality experience. I suppose you could think about a constant uh, uh, payment uh, varying, well, any uh, constant or time varying, but you're not varying with aggregate uh, mortality experience. I guess you're learning about mortality over the course of the pool, so you wouldn't want to, I don't think, pre-commit to a time trend. Rather, you'd want a uh, time trend as a function of aggregate mortality experience. If you think about a generation, like Jonathan said, so think about it as a whole generation, but there's still the aggregate risk, and you could vary the payments as a function uh, uh, as you learn what the true, uh, true mortality is going to be. So in terms of design, uh, you could create a structure where every year uh, you hire an actuary to look at how many people died and to try to smooth the payments, and they introduce discretion, and you've just given the actuary a job for life. I think that you want to design a product that is actuary free. And I think Jeremy would agree with me on that one. No? You need them at the very, very beginning. Well, you can do to get. Yeah. Right? You can yeah. set the function. And, and yeah. you should set the function of mortality. And then, yeah. you know, you're going to have to hire somebody to figure there, out. There's a trade off between. Let, let me, Tom, let me put it this way. Your design would increase utility because then we have adjustments. But the transparency and the simplicity of the design starts to decay. It's very difficult to explain to grandma. So what's going to happen is there's this moving average formula. And depending on the number of people that die over the last 12 years divided by, here's look, this is the numerator. This is the denominator. We're splitting it. So I completely agree with you. There are participating annuities, pooled annuity funds, and the actuarial literature has been going in these complex structures that would maximize or give you a bit more utility at the expense of Discretion, I think. Yeah. Well, no. Okay, good. So, Moshe, my, my question is actually related to that question. Uh, why is it that we're not, what happened to participating annuities? Why is TIACREF the only one? And what is the regulatory barriers to participating annuities and for investment companies to create a TON team? Well, you know, the book's about 400 pages. It's available on Amazon. And, 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 you know. You know, historically there were problems. I'll just tell you, in 1906, the New York State Insurance Commission banned tontine insurance. It was a very popular product until then, and they banned it. And when New York banned it, all the other insurance commissions followed suit. So there have been shenanigans over the years. There have been fraud problems. There, there, there's a, a taint associated with tontines. There's, you know, the laugh factor, really, so I die and they get more. So there have been a whole bunch of regulatory screw-ups, so to speak, over the years. But my understanding from the lawyers, which I am not, is that there's nothing in the acts that prohibit the design that I described here. So to make a very long story short, I think it's doable. Now, gosh. Yeah, I, I guess just a comment about the pure team, which is you know, a fascinating concept. But I guess the one comment I'd make on this, and I'm interested to see if Jeremy agrees, a pure team is not a risk-free endeavor for the company that's putting it forth. From an actual point of view, you'd have a lot of concern because basically it's a last survivor annuity, right? So it's not, it's not at each person's death, their little payments stop. It's the singular payment, the single annuity payment stops at the last survivor's death. And there's a lot of risk in that. So this is not at all a risk-free kind of situation from an insurance point of view. It reminds me a little bit of sort of like a CPI indexed annuity which for understandable reasons, a lot of companies aren't too interested in because there's more and more uncertainty the farther you go out in terms of longevity. And so the smaller the payments are in that area of large uncertainty, the better off you are in terms of not worrying about the risk. CPI indexed annuity is a lot more load on the risk for people who might live longer than you're expecting or 
hoping, and therefore it's a, it's a more costly situation. With the tontine, it's sort of the same thing. How long is that last person to die going to live? And there's and the full load of the annual payments are on that person. Right. So, so there, I, I there would two, be concern. I have two replies, one historical, one mathematical, and in 30 seconds. Historically, they were capped once you had about five to 10 people left. So there really wasn't the last survivor. It was when will there be five or 10 people left? That and when you help. look at the rows, that helped. Number two, if you design this properly, the payments at the very, very end are going to be much, much smaller than the payments in the beginning because the numerator should decline over time because the denominator is declining. So when you look at the risk on a present value basis, you're talking about a tiny amount of capital that you would have to set aside to worry about whether in 45 years from now the group dies or in 46 years from now the group dies. On a present value basis, it will be low. But I agree with you. There will be some capital required. So I, I just want to link Andrew's paper to Tom's paper this morning, which is you know this question of take-up rates and why they're so low. And Tom had a comment about, well, people just don't trust financial institutions when they come and talk to them. And so I wonder with an annuity, if the issue isn't people perceive counterparty risk, maybe appropriately, maybe not, and they feel a sense of control, again, maybe rationally, maybe not, if they have their own portfolio relative to sort of handing it over to a company that promises them income for a period of time. And so that there's a, just a trust issue here. Well, we have our question uh, has a go at being completely trustworthy, but of course they, it's a fantasy. So in our fantasy of this particular product, it's risk-free. So that's explicitly stated. There is no problem of that nature. Uh, and in the particular case of annuities, the statements were very much no. Now, it, and I think we need to take on board the possibility. I'm not denying that it might be that there was a taint and the word annuity made that happen. And I'm not denying the possibility that, you know, they, that if, that, that our ideas coming in were correct, that they should be doing what we thought they should be doing. I just also believe that they might be right for themselves. And they're saying no. And that our job, to some extent, for scientists, is to understand that answer. And I, I think that there's still a leftover for, ha, huh, we're not inside their head appropriately. That's kind of why, and that, that the question is at the beginning of, like, could you tell me your story? And it might be very much more, I, I don't know what's going on for that. I, I do think that the idea that they are now retired, and this is kind of, this is their endowment, this is their money. That's it. It ain't coming back. And you ask me, well, why don't you go buy something? And you know, and I you say, you know, actually, the best global insurance I have is called money. I worked long and hard to get it, and now you have an idea for me on how to use it. That's very nice. And our Vanguard people are actually vaguely hostile around the number of times we came at them around annuities. They said, kind of, don't you get it? <laughs> we actually had a few people pull out of the study because they felt we were flogging annuities. So I mean, I just don't know. We have time for one more question in the back. Um, someone mentioned the, the new treasury regs on longevity annuities. I just wondered what the panel thought of these annuities where the payout doesn't begin till 80 or 85, and whether that's going to be a more attractive uh, instrument for people who are 55 or 60 who may have a reasonable financial plan for 15 years but have no idea what's going to happen later. Uh, to me, it, it's still a problem that the, uh, if a person retires, a single person, say, at 65, good health might last on average 12 years and poor health three more. There's still a lot of uncertainty. You don't know whether you're going to live to be 85. You don't know whether you're going to start to need this money when you're 75 and you'll be 10 years into it if you're still alive at 85. Uh, you're not, I don't know, how, you'd have to do the calculation to see how much uh, uncertainty is still left. 
take an opportunity to plug Sandy and the Journal of Retirement, because that journal that's standing out there has uh, three articles on this exact topic that have run the numbers and have looked at the utility gains. So there's a lot of research on that. And if you throw it into utility function, most of them say, yes, this is a good instrument to have. If you ask people about it, they don't like it. So there you have it. Which, uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. I'm, I'm Canadian, he's Canadian, so I, I may be biased, but I, I really do think it's a great book. Uh, sorry, I was saying, I think his book really is great. It's, it's not just uh, very entertaining and informal, uh, it's extremely informative, so I strongly recommend it.